example is going to work for you guys on the screen, but you can watch how it turns out here in the discussion. This is a communication activity that I use in Mr. Oh, I'm Sharon. Hi. Um, accounting, accounting, business, and whatever else comes my way. Um, I use this activity in Intro to Business primarily because it's a way to facilitate for business students to teach business students about communication in in the work world. Because we talk about how our students don't have the words, they don't have the demeanor, there's things they don't understand. So it's like a game of telephone. If I tell them we're playing telephone, they know what I'm talking about. So I give the message to one person verbally, and then they have to communicate it to the person behind them. And then that person has to communicate it to the next person. And then we see how much is lost, how much information is lost. And what we find out that some of it's memory, but quite a bit of it is context in terminology. A student may not understand what business casual is versus business dress. They may not understand ride sharing, but they understand Uber. So it gives us a chance to talk about breakdowns in communication, how we fix those, and ways we can address those challenges. So for those of you on the screen, this only really works when I have face-to-face. So you get to judge the people here <laughs> on ground. So I'm going to give, we'll see if we have a volunteer. One of the three here, I'm going to, they're not going to be able to see the message that I'm giving them either. They're just going to listen to it. And then they are going to have to pass it to the next person. And then that person's going to have to pass it to the next one. And we'll see how many details get lost in conversation. This is also a good one to do with drawing. You can have students do it with a picture, show them a diagram, and have them communicate it verbally. It's also a good way to see a lot of students start to fall asleep in your class. This makes them get up and move. So who wants to volunteer? Me, me. Okay, can you come up here? Okay. You two, I need you to go out of the room for a minute. Because you can't hear what I'm doing here. And you can't see what I'm doing either. Okay. And you can't write it then. Go for okay. it. Can we hear it? I mean, we can hear it. Yes, you you can hear it because you're not going, you're not playing the game. So we're testing my memorization skills of what it boils down okay. to. Okay, and if you would if you tilt that camera up so we can see your face. I don't know why it's long and it's cool and I can see you. I don't know how to make any of this. Oh, there. Is that better? Okay. Okay. okay, you guys can hear it. So as they're passing the information, it'll give you a cue into what we're missing, what they're missing in communication. Okay. Can Alexis, can you hear us? Okay. Okay. I'm not going to talk super loud because I don't want them to hear it out in the room, but if you come over here, I'll read it. Okay. Okay, so we're going to, Stacy would be, I would be the supervisor, and Stacy would be my employee, and I'm passing her along some information. We have a meeting with our new client, Mini Moto Excellence, on Tuesday the 23rd. Jared booked your tickets. You're traveling with Antonia, the new rep in Manger Account Sales. Her email hasn't been set up yet, so can you catch up with her and give her the details? You're flying business class, but can bump the first class if there's a vacancy. Remember to get a receipt so you can code the charge correctly. Your flight leaves at 8A, but remember that security is tough, so you need to get there at least three hours early. Oh yeah, make sure you ride share because we won't pay for long-term parking. Or for checked baggage, so pack for carry-on. The meeting's at noon, but you should get to their office by 11.30 for setup. You'll need financials, the portfolio, meeting agenda, laptop for presentation, and to take notes. Or you can use a tablet if you want. Just check one out from Lucy and IT. Oh, I almost forgot. I told them we'd provide lunch. You can order for delivery, but might want to check with their admin about delivery details. They typically dress business casual, but you should aim for business. If there's a golf course around there, might suggest going to the golf going to the golf club and take them somewhere swanky for dinner. Put it on your P card. Your flight leaves on the floor. Don't be late for it. You'll get back in time to report to the office for a report in the meeting. I want to see a solid executive summary with your report to share with executives. So now we'll call the other team back in and she has to communicate and in a business example I would say Stacy would maybe go to she's traveling with Antonia she would go to Antonia's assistant and say, here's all this information. Can you please give it to Antonia? And we'll see how close we get, but they can't write it down. I 
I was a bad person to start this. <laughs> okay, wait, only one at a time. Only one at a time. Okay. Now you communicate to her what I told you, you but she can't write it down okay. either. This is all I remember. Okay, but be kind of quiet. We don't want him to okay. hear. This is all I remember. Minimoto, 23rd, Picard. That's what I remember. Okay, okay. that's all she's got. So wait here, you have to communicate to him. Okay, come on in, Antonia. Hello? <laughs> Hi. No, no. So you tell him what you got. Mini Moto 23rd P card. And you see how he's looking at her with confusion? I'm lost. Okay, have a seat. <laughs> this usually takes a whole lot longer in the classroom, but this is typically what happens. And it's not unusual in the business setting for this to happen. We have emails, students are like, too much on email. They think they can jot something down. They think they can remember it, especially if they've been wait staff somewhere where they just remembered order and have it written it down. Imagine if this is Antonia, and all Antonia got was Minimoto, the 23rd, and P card. And Tony would you read the message to them? So we will. Yeah, we will. And Tony would be like, what? Who's Minimoto? <laughs> And what, who are you? I don't even know who you are. And what's a P card? I have no idea what a P card is. So for those of you that were in here, here was the message I gave her yeah, to pass to you. That the, this is where my brain is mid-afternoon. Well, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. this frazzled. So. And, but this happens in the business world. Well, it happens, I think, in our classrooms, too, when we're lecturing. Yep. And they get mm -hmm. pieces. Snippets. So this is what I told Stacy, which turned into Minimoto, the 23rd, and P card. Yeah, this is all I got out of this, right? You have a <laughs> meeting with our new client, Minimoto Excellence, on Tuesday, the 23rd. Jared booked your tickets. You're traveling with Antonia, a new rep in major account sales. Her email hasn't been set up yet, so you can catch up. Can you catch up with her and give her the details? You're flying business class, but can bump up to first if there's a vacancy. Remember to get a receipt so you can code the charge correctly. Your flight leaves at 8 a.m., but remember that security is tough, so you have to get there at least three hours early. Oh, yeah, make sure you ride share because we won't pay for long-term parking or check luggage, so pack for carry-on. The meeting is at noon, but you should get to their office by 11.30 for setup. You will need financials, portfolio, meeting agenda, and laptop for presentation and to take notes. Or you can take a tablet if you want. Just check one out from Lucy and IT. I almost forgot. I told them we would provide lunch. You can order it for delivery, but might want to check with admin about delivery and details. They typically dress business casual, but you should aim for business. If there's a golf course around there, I might suggest going to the golf, going to golf at the local club and take them somewhere swank, swanky for dinner. Put it on your P card. Your flight leaves on the 24th. Don't be late for it. You'll get back in time to report back to the office for a report and meet about the meeting. I want to see a solid executive summary with your report to share with executives. So what do you guys remember <laughs> from that? <laughs> I was okay. wanting to know. Yeah. 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 There's, there's one author there. Exactly. So, <laughs> so there's something that we learned from this. Time. Are you guys golf course? It's <laughs> chunking data. We need to chunk information to our students. And I do stuff like this. I kind of go over the top with things to purposely make them laugh because I know they're not going to remember all of it. And I know in the real world, they would be taking, hopefully, be taking notes or ask for an email. So we get to that set. What would you do in the real world in business? And we talk through that, what that looks like in the real world. We talk about why we remember things, why it's important in communication. I'll guess you remember P card because we have a P card. Mm -hmm. And so she associated the P card in the 24th. The 23rd. 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 23rd.
would some of our demographic groups know? So here's words that they might not know out of this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to show that screen. How do I do that? You want to show yourself? Yeah, just show the words because I have them up there. While you're doing that, this was very valuable for me because I think John might be all over. I think I know how to do it. And when you turn it, you go to content. You hit a menu. In IDL, you go to content. And that's what happened with you. Karen, you turned your head a little bit off in the hearing. Well, that's a good you point. You changed the screen through Carol and Alexis. You know, yeah, so. That's so a good point. Humbly, yeah. And I had lost that. What was the point that she made? I'm sorry. When I turn away from the camera, they have trouble hearing me. Mm -hmm. So that's important for IDL. It's for communication in general, right? So I put up on the screen, here's the email I sent to myself so I remember what I was saying. Words in here that students will most likely not recognize, either culturally, demographically, socioeconomically. They just haven't had the experience. Um, I'm traveling with Antonia. I didn't specify what kind of travel until later. So they may not understand what that means. Major account sales, if we're talking about business. Uh, let's see, flying business class but can bump up the first if there's a vacancy. I guess most of our students that they have flown have been coached, you know, the cheapest flight. They don't know what business class is and they don't know how to bump up to first class. They don't know how to go up and request that. Um, let's see, coding your charges correctly. That's an accounting term we talk about coding. We have to do that here. Right? We have to code our receipts and our charges, but students aren't familiar with that. Um, eight o'clock, but remember that security is tough, so you have to get there at least three hours early. Ride sharing, many of our students understand, well, if they're in rural areas, they might not understand ride share if they don't have Uber or Lyft, or they might only understand the term Uber and not ride share. And if you go to an airport and you get on a ride share, that's what it says. It doesn't say Uber, it says ride share. And that's where you go to get your, your place. Um, let's see. You'll need financials, portfolio, meeting agenda, and laptop. What are financials? What does that entail? Words that if students have not been exposed to it in accounting specifically, they won't understand what that means. And so words that students don't understand, those really get flipped in communication because they assign their own meaning and they change the word. And it changes the entire meaning of the conversation. And portfolio is one. They might not know what IT is. Lucy and IT. What's IT? And we have to explain help desk, support. Um, check with their admin. What's an admin? Who's that? Why do I have to check with that person? What's a P card? Can I charge that to people? I didn't know I could go, I had to go to a club for golf. There are all these components outside of just general communication tactics, making sure you can hear, making sure you can see, and have a relationship, the words get in the way. So in class, if you apply it to the classroom, you with accounting all the time, we have a lot of big words in accounting. And I have to really slow down to explain what those words mean for students. So I use this in intro to business. I'm going to start using it in accounting in the spring. And I'll be plugging in the big words like <coughs> look at the balance sheet, what's the net income, how do we get to the resolution, what's our asset turnover, and have them do the same process and see what the words change into. And it'll probably be Mini moto, twenty third, and P card, because they don't understand the concept. So beyond the demographic, the socioeconomic, our diversity, words in their specialty, this is also just a brain break for students from lecture. They think it's fun. They like to laugh at themselves. I do it with pictures as well. I'll bring up groups. I'll show them a picture of like stick figures or people or an architecture design, 
And one person has to go back and communicate it to one person. They have to draw it. And then I take that paper away, and then they have to communicate it to the next person. And I take their paper away. And we see what the transition is. As an educator, it makes me very aware of things students don't know, but I assume they do know. And it's a great way of formative assessment and doing constructive, constructive learning for our students because it lets them know and find out where their weaknesses are. It's not just us saying, you're wrong, and putting a check mark on the paper. So you can do this with anything. This is very similar to the one I used in Intro to Business. But you can alter it for anything you have. In math, you could verbally give them an entire math problem. We've been doing, we did that in Excel today. It was C4 minus the sum of A5 and C4. Give them that verbal and let them communicate it back to each other and see how far you get. Give them a story out of literature that they're maybe not familiar with and have them communicate it back and forth with each other. You can have them sit in a circle, you can have them sit in rows. You just have to make sure that they're playing by the rules. Because sometimes they like to cheat, they like to whisper to each other or listen to the other team. And I usually have candy or something I throw out for this group that's the closest when they get to the end. So that's my active learning stuff. Any questions? Okay, uh, one question is, do you get enough time to do all of those other things, the things you described here? I typically do. Students move, I don't have to put as much explanation into it because I'll do the um, think, pair, share on these components. Can you explain what think, pair, share? So um, think, pair, share, we will, if we did this activity, and we got done, I would ask the students to think about what was missed. Why did they miss the information? How did they miss it? What was the reason? Then I have them partner with someone else and discuss why, to share their ideas about why it didn't work. And then we share as a whole class. I don't do these all the time, but this kind of activity is very helpful to get them out of the textbook. Because be honest, students don't read the textbook. Uh, we can assign it all we want, they don't read the textbooks. It's just not how they learn. A program like this, we've put in diversity, we've put in communication, we've put in business language and terminology, we've put in grammar, formatting. It's all in one lesson. You'd have to get more creative with math. I'm not quite sure how that would work completely. But maybe operators, order of operations. You could have them do something with order of operations and see how different their numbers are when they get to the back because they didn't follow the order of operations. But I don't do I don't do that kind of math. So. All right, thank you so much. Anything else? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you stop the screen share? Thank you. Um. <laughs> I like what you said about giving the students a break because I think I can almost see where this would just get their mind going in a different direction. And then when you did start back up with your lecture, it might be a little easier for them to focus on the first part of it because you relax their brain to kind of enjoy an activity because that emits a very different response and chemicals in their brain in terms of learning. So. And they're, they're still it. learning. They just don't know they're learning. They think it's a game. Yeah. Gamifying everything that you can. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Experience here. I'm going to by the time we're done with this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Stacey Freeman. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm an English instructor here at Highland Community College. Um, I'm in my fourth year here at Highland. 
I wanted to talk for, with you guys for a few minutes about why we want to do the learning community. Over the past few years, I've heard a lot about the students we used to have, as opposed to the students that we have now. All of the complaints have something to do with the idea that the students we have now are in some way worse than the students we used to have. It's been approximately 10 years since Common Core Standards were introduced to schools across the United States. Common Core was designed to help students to become college and career ready. So in theory, the students that we have right now should be well prepared for college. The reality, as you know it, is much different. I want to share a quote with you. A recent study from ACT.org states that of the 1.9 million students who took the ACT in 2018, 35% met none of the ACT college readiness be benchmarks. 35%. According to the same document, the situation is even more dismal for underserved lear learners. That's low income, minority, first-generation college students. If you think of our students, what are they? Low-income, minority, first-generation college students. And these make up 43% of those taking the ACT. Once again, fewer than a fourth of underserved graduates showed overall readiness for college coursework. My intention is not to criticize common course candidates. The opposite is actually true. My 14-year-old son has been in Common Core for pretty much his entire school career. He's, he gets mostly A's and B's in his courses. And in addition to that, he has higher level critical thinking skills that I cannot even imagine have had during that time frame when he, I was his age. There was no way, way I was as advanced as he is right now. Now, it could, be, it could be that his grades and his intellect, it could be because I harass him all the time to get good grades, it could just be his work, work ethic, but I think it's more than that. I think it's his teachers and the way they've been teaching them. As far as I'm aware, Common Core focuses on hands-on activities. That's problematic for us. So the students, who are coming to us now have spent their elementary and their high school years doing hands-on activities. They've been learning by doing. And then they come to Highland and they sit in a classroom in neat little rows and they're expected to shut up, pay attention, and do their homework. And listen to a teacher who stands in front of the classroom and simply lectures, and that's all that's offered to them. They don't know how to learn that way. My point is that the problem isn't our students. Yes, they may be unprepared or maybe underprepared for college, but it's not entirely their fault, and it's not going to change anytime soon. I think the fault lies with us, with higher education and our teaching methods compared to the teaching methods that they had prior to coming to us. To me, we can either continue complaining about our students, as we have, as I've listened to for the last four years, or we can do something about the issues we're seeing. And doing something about the issues we're seeing starts every day in our classrooms. This might mean changing the way that we do things in our classrooms. Change is hard, I get it. But if we intend to compete with things like Snapchat and Twitter, we have to be fresh and innovative. This semester, I spent the summer looking at everything I was doing in my classrooms. And then I took everything that I was doing in my classrooms and I put it in the garbage. I threw it away and I started over from scratch. Every activity I now do in my classroom is an activity. They are learning by doing. To me, we are well past the point where we can complain. Well past it. Retention is abysmal. 
my students, a student in my classroom, my, my uh, developmental classroom, came to me just the other day and he says, I was looking at the Highland website and it said that retention in here is 26%. I didn't verify, I trusted him on that. If we want to continue recruiting and retaining students, we need to consider what we're doing in our classrooms and what we can do to improve, which is why this is so important. And the more people that we can get here, the better off our students will be. I'd like to show you something that Dr. Shaw shared with me. I'm going to share the screen again, okay? Um, and it's something they're doing at North Seattle, I believe. North Seattle Community College. And it's this learning community. And while you're pulling that up, I'll point out there's a proposal now in um, Education Committee. I don't think it's for the state. I think it's at the federal level to discount ACT and SAT scores and rely solely on student GPA for admission. At least to, I don't, didn't remember if it was for state colleges or I have to look it up again. But if we're already concerned that we have students that aren't prepared, if they're coming from schools that are not good schools that have to deal with trauma, you know, everything else that goes with that, they may have a high GPA, but not in comparison to a student that maybe happens to come from a Johnson County, Shawnee Mission High. Mm -hmm. They'll come in looking like the same student, but we won't have very many ways other than early on assessment tests to determine if they need to go into developmental courses. So that block that we have now, if you will, a block, is going to quickly go away if that passes through committee and it gets voted on. Our students do not do SAGE on the stage. And we are keeping so many students that have traumatic backgrounds or first generation college students. They already feel challenged by being here, by being in college. They already, if you ask them, what story are you telling yourself? They will say, I'm telling myself that I'm not good enough, I shouldn't be here, I should go home. And if we are not setting the stage for them to be successful, we're reinforcing that story that they're telling themselves. Well, not only that, they had that story before they came here, but that story is still relevant now. I had a student come to me the other day, says, I'm so sorry I haven't been in class. I had to go home because my mom has a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. How do you even respond to that? You know, and this is, most of our students have these affective issues that are happening outside the classroom beyond what we can even see. So we need to start addressing those issues within our classroom, with, with our students, individually with our students, obviously, about how to deal with life issues in addition to balancing college. I mean, our students struggle on, on many different, many different. I had a student just tell me today he won't be here next week because he's having a baby. Yes, I have the same student. And I said, hey, who? How yeah, exciting. I'm yeah. so excited yes. for you. And he said, I'm scared. Yeah, he's terrified. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what it's going to do with school. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Reinforcing the story. Right. I thought we should be joyful. As a community, we should be supporting him. We should be excited about that, not hammering him over the head and saying, well, this is your deadline. This is your time when things are due. So I just wanted to share this PowerPoint that comes from North Seattle Community College. Um, I'm not going to share the entire PowerPoint. I'll probably skip over a few things. But it talks a little bit about what a faculty learning community is. We have to decide as, as a community here what we want to do with our faculty learning community. Um, and everyone's going to have input in that. I, I personally love that Sharon was willing to give a presentation today, and I would love to see that from every meeting that we have, someone volunteering your presentation. So a faculty, according to this, a faculty learning com community is a self-organized group. It's cross-disciplinary. I mean, what, what uh, disciplines do we have represented here today? <coughs> English. <coughs> Math, English, photography, math. Early childhood and human services. Early childhood. Anyone else there? And chemistry. Chemistry. Okay, so we have a wide variety of um, disciplines here. Um, and the idea is to work collaborati co collaboratively over an extended period of time to investigate, research, apply, and assess a strategy for improvement of teaching and learning. 
And I'll probably skip a few slides. What they are not. It's not a committee. It's not a book club. <laughs> yeah, no, we have enough committees, right? But it's not another committee. Um, this is completely voluntary. Uh, it's not a committee, it's not a book club, it's not an action research project or inquiry project, it's um, not a task force, it's not a social group or organization, a cadre. But they are a structure and process for solving teaching and learning issues, highlight specific teaching and learning issues. All of you are here, which tells me that you may be encountering some issues and some challenges that we can address here. And this is what they say is important for a su successful FLC. Responsiveness, relevance, respect, of course. Um, openness, empowerment, safety, and trust. We have to feel comfortable with one another. Just like we want to build relational capacity with our students, we also want to build relational capacity among our colleagues. We want to feel free to share. Um, safety and trust, collaboration, challenge, enjoyment, and spirit to Um, let's skip over this. Why do, do you, would you guys be okay with doing this think pair share? Sure. Can you sure. spend a few minutes maybe writing down what you observed in your class about your students' learning that intrigues you, or would you rather just talk about it for a few minutes? I think, well. I think we can just chat about it. Just chat about it. Yeah. <clears throat> so what have you observed in your class about your students' learning that intrigues you? Very little resilience in some cases. Are you guys encountering that too? Sharon said the, the, there's very little resilience. If they don't understand it, they're not going to push forward and do oh, it. Yeah. So in accounting, I tell them, try the work. I don't care if it's wrong. You wouldn't be here if you didn't need to learn it. And we'll solve it together. But they're not resilient enough to say, oh, I think I got that first one wrong. I'm going to keep going. They just stop. So are they lacking grit or growth mindset? Do they believe that they cannot improve? What do you think? I think it's very specific to the content. One kid today said, oh, I'm horrible at math. And I said, who told you you were horrible at math? And he said, well, I had a teacher. I said, uh-uh. I said, you can do math. You just haven't learned it. But he had shut down on a project because he missed a number in his addition, and it threw his final, final item off. Do you think sometimes... Alexa, <laughs> Alexis isn't able to speak. Not that she's not able to actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> she's been chatting. She's not doing enough chat. Okay. And when she said, I think they feel overwhelmed very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I, that too, I'm always surprised that people go to resilience. When they come to class, they don't have their assignment done. And they'll say, oh, well, that website didn't work. And did you try again? Did you try a different way to get there? No, they just seem to think if it just wasn't, I say this kind of negatively, if it wasn't given to them, wrapped in a package, then they couldn't find it, they couldn't stick with it. I've been paradigm shifting now. I, I believe that I, I've been reading a lot about trauma-informed teaching, and I think you're right, our, our students are very, they're, they're all overwhelmed, they're traumatized, they come from very, chaotic lives. Um, so I think that I'm learning a lot this semester. And I, I agree with you, but I think it's important not only to question why is this happening, but what can we do about it? Because we have, to me, we have a larger responsibility than just talking about our, our course material. Um, this semester, I've started talking about, well, I've been talking about it, but the concepts of grit and growth mindset, the big five non-cognitive skills, um, Highlands SPEs, they're all interrelated. And if, if students were hearing some of this stuff in all of their courses, reinforced in all of their courses, perhaps they get the idea that they can grow. And even telling them that, I always say, you're all going to be managers one day. When you're all CEOs, 
speaking that into them. I had a couple students show up late to class one day, about 20 minutes. They came up after class and he said, okay, let me have it. And I said, uh, let you have what? I didn't have any handouts. And he said, just let me have it. I said, what are you talking about? I'm not clear. And he said, well, we were late, so just go ahead and let us have it. I said, well, why would I do that? I said, it's your class. I get paid whether you're here or not. Doesn't matter to me one way or another. I can walk you through what you missed. But he assumed he may not have come in if he thought he was going to get yelled at. But if you reinforce that you're an adult, you make decisions, I help you make good decisions and make critically informed decisions. And so if we do have a teacher that is telling a student, why are you late, you know what time we start, you know, just railing them over the coals, they're going to make the decision to not come to class if they oversleep 10 minutes. Whereas if they show up 10 minutes late and the instructor says, well, okay, that was your choice, but you missed your attendance points, it's five points, and you missed this piece, but welcome to class. It's how we approach them. We need to be partners in the learning, not the sage on the stage. That means sometimes letting them go over into conversations that you think really have no, <laughs> no place in the classroom, but it's how they process information. It's a change management process for these students. Do you think that's a, the underlying issue at Highland? Is the um, lack of resilience? Do <coughs> you think it has a ripple effect? That's my, my question is how do you overcome it? it that's, that's the question. Yeah. So how I, do you overcome I, it? I believe it. I go for the wheel over me and I'm not for the semester. Some of our classes already have 40 quizzes. That means I have written quizzes every day. So when I come to the class, I only write three things on the white on the board. I say, okay, this is the topic we'll be talking today. This is a worksheet we will be working in a group. Uh, last 10 minutes, I will give you the quiz. So, so the student knows if they fall in sleep or they stay on their phone, they get a quiz, they push, uh, quiz point. And my quiz is already uh, way heavy uh, towards the break. I put 40% uh, point on Monday uh, as a weight for my quizzes. So quizzes are heavy, I really uh, use one of my classes. And I give them question, 20 questions. I say, OK, uh, I give them 10 minutes lecture first. Take questions from them over the two, three years. They say they are okay. They don't have any questions. So I hand up, uh, I give them hand out, pretty much 40, 50 questions, 60 questions, probably sometime for the entire week, 100 questions. I say, okay, usually we're working like first uh, 10 or 15 questions today, and I will pick a random question from there as a quiz. So they know that if they, they fall asleep or they talk, they're they missing the main points every day. That forced them to work. I think I've seen a lot of improvement in the class, uh, class in this semester. Uh, I don't have more than three absentees in any, any day, any day. Those people do not show up to the class because they are not coming to the class anyway. They are not probably hiring anymore. So I do have really high attendance because I left them work in a group. Uh, but I put one return back. If you work in a group, make sure you even compete for each other. We understand. So whenever there should be the, the, the quiz at the, at the end of the class, if I suspect the copy from somebody, I say, okay, I haven't had satisfied with you writing or in explanation. Can you please explain me a similar question? I pretty much ask this question randomly. So they know that if they cheat or I suspect, they don't they miss everything. That person to work, and I do have like, actually today, three minutes there. If I have time, I can show it to you. Uh, I do some video for the class, it's probably 15 seconds, 20 seconds. I try to pass all of them. I cannot do, do all of them to my phone, but I can pass all of them. So if I have time, I can show it to you today. What I do is what I I would suggest too, when we talk about how do we help students. It's not about, we can't help everybody, we just can't. But if you pick one student in your class that seems to have the most challenges, work with that student. 
go up to them and say, hey, I noticed you haven't been turning or I have these other challenges. And if we can get one, then that one starts telling the others, hey, this teacher's going to work with you. Hey, this is what they did for me. But if we think too big, we can't yeah, they can do anything. anything. I uh, actually I see I have my table and chair ready. I bring all the special for it. I tell hey, I'm ready for you guys. Individually you can come or you can come as a group to me. If you get stuck or if you don't understand, just come to me. But most of the time they work with themselves, they just come to me to check the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but so I would suggest to you, if I'm not strong in math, they come I'm probably one. one. But I don't know that I would probably come. I would probably come to you. But if you came to me and said, "I noticed on your test you're almost there. You're so close. Mm -hmm. Let me help you." It's different if you approach me. But if I approach you, I have to be very vulnerable for that. And our students don't want to be vulnerable. They don't want to be seen as weak. In most cases, but at least my, my, if I have this for a perspective on understanding, is this student is really working. But I understand it from point, but that could there could be some one student like that. But those are exceptional. But most students really they try to learn. And they don't they don't come to me in class. Right. I, I have to come to the office out. They come to the office of the community. But this is working for my class. Well like now you what you said and you really you you give them a target. You I say direction is going. Here's the objective. Here's how I plan to do something. Alexis made a very good comment, and I agree. She says, I feel like this is a better plan than doing the early academic maximum alert. Yes. Every time I have filled one of those out, the student doesn't return. And I think that's an excellent point, Alexis. In my experience, it's been the same. By the time I fill it out, they're gone. They don't come back. So we meet, if you're interested, we're going to meet again in um, on October 17th at 3 p.m. Do you guys know what direction you would like the Faculty Academy to go? Some of our members just left, but, but do, you, do you want to keep doing the teaching presentations? I think presentation is the most uh, useful thing. What you do, what you exactly doing in your class, if you can show us, that would really help. We need everyone to show their experience in the classes, mm -hmm. from the classes, we can learn from each other. So I really was really trying to see some demo today. That was my group. I I agree, like I, I love the examples because then it does kind of get your mind going. I actually wrote down your growth mindset, Stacey, because there's a ton of stuff I read there, but I teach teachers. I think that probably makes a little bit of difference because I want them to be such good teachers. But uh, that I agree. Now, here's one thing I've always wanted to do at Highland. I would like to be able to paint a wall in a classroom a color. There's a lot of, I, I don't know why that has bothered me, but white boxes with brown furniture yeah. are not a good environment for learning. There's a ton of research out there. So I was thinking, gee, maybe for my PPCA, I'd like to paint that room right there, even if it was just a pale blue, because that's considered one of the better colors for learning. Wouldn't it be interesting to see if, if, it, if even you, just something yeah. that small would make a difference because honestly, how boring, how much more boring could our classrooms be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the environment is stuff in it. But I yeah, I'm all the coming and I like to learn. I think I can. did you want some of the you want me to share some of the stuff that I'm uh, using for the growth mindset, the exercise that I do? I can send that information yeah. to you. Okay. I love it. Okay, hang on. Here's Alexis. And she also thanked me for being her mouthpiece. You're very well. Um, she talked to Todd Meyer. They've been trying to push an aesthetics committee. Yep. Eric told Todd he couldn't have a classroom painted. And so I gave him paint from my house, and he did it on his own time. That I don't mind doing it myself either. I've got good paint. Wow. And so I just do it. Honestly, really, what's somebody going to do? I mean, at this stage of my career, fire me, I'm retiring. I'm, I am up for trying anything new. This is the year for me to do it. So, I, I think, I mean. I think that one would be really 
yeah. ability to like make it like five to ten years big enough for class. We can watch all of them and learn each other. I'd love that. So if you're interested in giving a teaching demonstration, email me, let me know, and um, we'll meet again in October and discuss what direction we'd like to, like this to go. Okay. So again, that was October 17th at 3 p.m. Yeah, I I still write everything down. I call this my high tech oh, tool. I do too. I have, and I don't. I, I have don't a, I have good. an agenda, so. so I, yeah, I just put it in my planner, so that's great. And Carol White, I want to thank you. Carol told me about this, and she told me a long time ago what day this meeting was. And she said, I and she said, I think you would really like it. So I had learning group academy question marks. I wasn't real sure what it was. And so, Carol, thank you for specifically inviting me and including me. Right. I love this stuff. So we'll see you guys next month. Or before that. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Bye.